An astute analyst wrote that by the time he became a lawyer, Pete Wilson had lost interest in being one. He said, what was missing, it seemed to me, was a sense of doing something for other people and a sense of doing something important. And that's why Pete Wilson entered politics, to do something for other people, to do something important. Pete was born in Illinois, but Jim and Peg Wilson moved to St. Louis, so that's where he grew up. In a recent interview, he said his dad was his greatest influence because he taught me values. He always said, never be less than you can be, and whatever you achieve, you have an obligation to give back. In high school, young Pete was a budding scholar and leader. The standout student was an outstanding athlete. His coach said he played football with precision and fight. Those words would describe him for the rest of his life. Pete Wilson, precision and fight. He attended Yale on a Navy ROTC scholarship. In his third year, he opted to join the Marine Corps and he spent three years as an infantry officer and platoon leader. He absorbed the core creed, honor, courage, commitment, and he has embodied it through all the years. While he was attending law school at Berkeley's Bolt Hall, he made his debut in politics as an advance man for Richard Nixon's 1962 gubernatorial campaign. That began a lifelong association the president became a mentor, and the former president became a friend. Pete is a longtime member of the Nixon Foundation's board of directors. The Nixon family asked Pete to eulogize Pat Nixon in 1993. The next year, they asked him to render the same sad service for President Nixon. When we met in 1962, he'd already debated Khrushchev and President Kennedy. He'd already run for president. He'd been a major political figure on the world stage. But still, he had time to talk to and to help an eager young advance man who could offer him little but energy and enthusiasm. Then in the fall of 1965, when I was 32, he honored me by asking me to come to work with him on his potential bid for the presidency in 1968. But he'd heard from Bob Finch and Herb Klein that I was thinking about running for office myself. I told him it was true. And he grinned. He grinned and he said, in that deep, rich voice of his, is it a good district? Can you win? And then he said, because if you can, then Pete, you've got to try, or you'll never forgive yourself. I was just another young lawyer trying to find his way in the world, and he was a former vice president preparing a bid for the highest office in the land. And yet, that day, he was as concerned with my future as he was with his own. Pete was practicing law in San Diego when he decided to run for the California State Assembly. He was elected in 1966 and re-elected in 68 and 70. Rising to Republican whip, he was chairman of the Committee on Urban Affairs and Housing. He worked closely with Governor Reagan. In 1971, Pete was elected mayor of San Diego. Early the next morning, the city's newest and youngest mayor had a wake-up call from a well-wisher. I have mayor-elect Peter Wilson. Yeah. Right there. Hello? Good morning, Mr. President. I bet I got you out of bed. I will confess that you did. I know. Well, anyway, it was a great victory, Pete. A great victory. How do you feel? You must feel pretty good or awful tired. Well, uh, slightly tired, but very, very good. Yeah. But did you win by more than you expected? Yes, I did. Uh, yeah, I just, that's a long time since you did that first advance in 62, isn't it? Yes, it is. You, uh, you sorry you got into politics? No, I uh, never have been, and I've also appreciated your advice. <laughs> I don't know if you any advice. I just want you to win. Mayor Wilson inherited a city in bad shape, a big naval port, 
bigger problems. He fixed its government, managed its growth, turned it into an international trade hub, launched the San Diego trolley, and transformed a derelict downtown into the gas lamp district, a vibrant place where people wanted to visit and live. After three terms as mayor, Pete set his sights on the U.S. Senate. At the start of his first Senate term, Pete Wilson married Gail Edlund. It was the perfect match. They supplemented and complemented each other. He was smart. She had a Phi Beta Kappa key. They were both devoted to doing things for others and doing something important. He liked to sing. She was an accomplished performer whose security code name was Nightingale. Gail liberated Pete's inner hand and the results were epic. Golden State, go for gold. Washington, Senator Wilson was respected on both sides of the aisle as a man who would take a stand and would stand by his word. As a member of the Senate Armed Services Committee, he supported President Reagan's defense policies. Unyielding on fiscal discipline, every year he was named Watchdog of the Treasury. He talked about budgetary discipline, and in 1985, he put his appendix where his mouth was. Less than 24 hours after an emergency appendectomy, he arrived on the Senate floor wearing pajamas and a bathrobe to cast a key budget vote before the ambulance rushed him back to the hospital. He ran for re-election in 1988 and won by a landslide. He was the first person to win more than 5 million votes in a Senate race and the 5.1 million votes he won set a record that wasn't broken until last year. Senator Wilson was an outspoken champion of Israel abroad and Japanese American citizens at home as the lead Republican co-sponsor of the Civil Rights Act of 1988. In 1990, he brought it all back home by making a bold run for governor of California. It was a tight, tough race, but Pete pulled it out. Governor Wilson inherited a $16 billion deficit. The Golden State was badly tarnished. The recession, out of control crime, schools in crisis. Ronald Reagan quipped, what's next, Pete? The plague of locusts? But Pete loved it. At last, he was in the perfect job to do something for people and to do important things. He reformed the state's hostile business climate throughout his two terms. He led the way on sweeping anti-crime, welfare and education reforms, positively influencing nearly every aspect of California's society and culture. Three years later, he was re-elected by a landslide with 55% of the vote. In 1991, Governor-elect Wilson inherited a $16 billion deficit. In 1998, Governor Wilson's successor inherited a $16 billion surplus. Thanks to Pete Wilson, 
the Golden State was glowing with pride and renewed faith in the California dream. Term limit laws he'd supported precluded running for a third term. He left Sacramento with record approval ratings. Pete has played a vital role in the World War II Museum in New Orleans. He said, it exists to teach the history that is not taught in America's public schools. The ageless lesson that freedom isn't free and that is far wiser and far less costly in lives to prevent war than to ignore obvious threats. In 2017, the museum paid him the perfect tribute. Visitors are greeted with the soaring 80-foot Governor Pete Wilson Liberty Flagstaff. This year marks 50 years, the golden anniversary of Pete's election as mayor of San Diego and the 30th anniversary of his election as governor of the Golden State. These days, he and Gail have more time to enjoy with the family, but they continue their commitment to California and the nation. What a life Pete Wilson has led. What a career he's had. Pete Wilson, precision and fight. Pete Wilson, honor, courage, commitment. Pete Wilson, doing things for other people, doing something important. Pete Wilson, champion of the American dream.